Okay, Mary, ready when you are. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Open Democracy's weekly live discussions. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we have an excellent panel today. Um, I'm Mary Fitzgerald. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Open Democracy. Open Democracy is a global media platform committed to challenging power and inspiring change. We do awesome investigative journalism and we lift up awesome voices like the women who are going to be on this call today. Um, uh, most importantly, we want this conversation to involve you. So thank you to everyone who submitted questions and comments ahead of time. We're going to try and address as many of them as we can. Um, if you're joining on Zoom, uh, if you have a question or comment for us, click chat at the icon at the bottom of your screen. You can type into the chat window. Um, if you're joining from Facebook, add your input and it'll be fed back and um, that will all be fed to me. Um, uh, I should say this, I say this every week, the disclaimer, um, we are broadcasting uh, in lockdown um, or semi-lockdown as we will discuss in a moment. Um, that means there might be some unscheduled interruptions from um, pets, uh, small children, um, other things that we weren't necessarily planning for, apologies in advance for any of those, um, and we will carry on regardless. Um, today we're joined by an excellent panel. We have um, Kate Belgrave, who's a journalist and author of a forthcoming book on the UK benefit system. We've got Sarah Arnold, who's a senior economist at the New, New Economics Foundation, and we've got Caroline Malloy, who's the editor of Open Democracy UK, um, and who wrote a fantastic uh, couple of pieces for us last week in including one called Don't Buy the Lockdown Lie. This is a government of business as usual, which I'd highly encourage you to read. And she and um, her colleague, Adam Ramsey, also um, uh, wrote a very powerful story about how call center workers are still being forced to go into work um, despite the risks posed um, to their health and to the health of others. Um, so thank you all so much for joining us. Um, we've had a number of excellent questions already submitted. Um, uh, from people who signed up to this. Um, I can't get uh, get to all of them, but um, to summarize, there, there have been a number of questions about um, what do we do? How do we um, fight back? So how can the left be organizing now to prevent um, those uh, people exploiting the crisis for their own gain? What can activists do? Should more workers be unionizing? Lots of questions about the longer term. How can we prevent poor people suffering again when this is all over? Um, what tangible solutions should be adopted to solve multiple inequalities in the benefit system? The universal basic income question came up and we'll come to that as well. Um, and um, a lot of people were talking about uh, particular groups that have been particularly hard hit by this crisis. So um, uh, Michael Orton said, you know, should child benefit be raised to 50 pounds a week? Um, should that become a cornerstone of the social security system? We have um, someone from the Green Party asking um, for us to talk about the disaster for disabled people, family carers, social care. And uh, we had a contributor pointing out that women and children seem to be hardest hit by this crisis. Um, so we're going to touch on all those themes and many, many more um, in this discussion. But I think I'd like to turn to Kate first. And Kate, if you could just paint, paint the picture for us before this crisis hit. You know, bring us the voices of people you've spoken to who have to in, who've been interacting with the benefit system. Um, you yeah. know, you've written powerfully about the dysfunction and callousness of that system. Um, but tell us where we were before COVID, um, and and yeah, let let us hear the voices you've been speaking to. Okay, um, I think I've been thinking about this a bit. I think the main thing before COVID, um, you really need to just see the context of say since two thousand and ten, really. Um, since the first Cameron Care government. And to me, the real changing point was certainly there because in the year cuts began, but around 2012 and 13 when the Welfare Reform Act came, so you had a whole raft of um, legislation and new concepts that the council to the continuation of and freezing of all this sort of thing, which was all based around taking more money off people who didn't have it in the first place. I think it's that sort of simple in many respects. And all that reform was incredibly punitive, um, all based on the notion that the reason people are in poverty is because they are useless. It's got nothing to do with the environment people are in, um, very low wages and so on and so forth. So at that time, I was dealing a lot with people who were sick or disabled, and they were first hit very hard. They'd already been out of hospital, um, 
Kate, Kate, I'm really sorry to interrupt you, but um, the sound quality is really bad because I think you've logged in on two devices. So I'm going to ask you, I, would okay. I want to come back to this question and I will ask you it again, but if you could mute yourself and log off one device and I'll go to Sarah and then I'll come back to you because I really would like to get that picture. And okay. I think people can't is that better? Uh, speak again. Is that better? Yes. Yes. Okay, that's cool. I've logged everything else off. Yeah, so please just carry on like and paint, paint the picture for us. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Okay, did you get did you get the stuff about sort of welfare reform? Because I think that's the start. And I, th I think the thing I will say is now people are involved in a system which is both badly designed, particularly about universal credit, um, really poorly staffed, particularly when you're thinking about job centres, um, DWP and council homes and offices. And the technology at the back of this is anyone who's using it for universal credit will know it's just absolutely dire. So I think you've got this three form of tech. Before COVID, I was doing a lot with people with homelessness and not just street homelessness, but people who have been placed in temporary and emergency accommodation for years, two, three, four years. No way out only going into um, private sector places, tenancies, AST tenancies for a year. Um, lots and lots of issues around job centres, and this is legacy stuff as well, JSA and ESA, Universal Credit being the latest kind of nail of the coffin. Kate, I'm so sorry yeah. to interrupt you again. The sound is still really bad, so we're only getting about half yeah. of what you say. Um, I, what I'll do is I'll let um, the team, because it was fine yeah. when we practised before, if you mute um, yourself and Julian and Adam can help you, um, and then uh, I'll come to I'll go to Sarah next and we can come back to you once we've troubleshot shot that. Sorry about that. No worries. So yeah, if you mute yourself for now and then and then we can try and work with you to sort it out. Um, Sarah, we picked up a bit of what Kate was saying and, and it would be great if you could sort of pick up what she was talking about, the picture um, before uh, COVID of how people were falling through different cracks in the benefit system, people who are in work and out of work. And then if you could um, bring us through to what's happened um, since this pandemic started and, and how the situation has changed or developed. Um, sure. Um, so is my sound okay before I start? Okay, great. So um, we entered this crisis with one of the weakest um, employment safety nets or, or welfare systems either among advanced economies globally or in the UK's own post-war history. Um, so prior to the crisis, out-of-work payments received by UK workers are the third lowest among 35 OECD advanced economies and the only other European country worse than us it was, uh, is Romania. Um, and in most other European countries, the out-of-work support is linked to earnings in work, but ours is set at a level designed to be much less generous than what any worker could earn. So a minimum wage worker getting roughly £300 a week after tax. Um, the main adult element of our main kind of benefit that is available to them is less than a third of that. Um, and so it's just not sufficient enough to cover the cost of living for, for many, many people, um, which was true before the crisis and is true now as well. But what, what the crisis has capitulated um, is a massive increase in unemployment, which we're seeing unemployment skyrocketing. Um, we've seen that with millions of people claiming universal credit, um, but estimates range somewhere from around kind of 2 million up to about 7 million um, with a conservative consensus, I think settling somewhere in the middle of around 3.5 million. And to put that in perspective, in the last financial crisis, the peak was around 2 million people after three years. So we're seeing a much harder and faster fall. Um, and many more people than, than the last crisis will face a reduction in hours and a reduction in pay, not to mention all the people that were already on universal credit in the first place and were struggling to, to survive on that. Now, many of those um, are, there are kind of many millions currently that are able to access some form of government income support schemes to replace lost income, the government uh, job retention scheme and the self-employment um, income support scheme, but not everyone can access that. I mean, plenty of people, their employers have just laid them off. Um, those who see a cut in hours cannot claim. Um, and the government's kind of already signaled that they're kind of winding down this job retention scheme. So what we need is a comprehensive social security system that will actually protect people um, at a much higher rate that's sufficiently generous um, to actually cover people's cost of living. Um, 
um, and is much less conditional. So people shouldn't be having to jump through loads and loads of hoops at a time of crisis. They're much more, less conditional and are much more generous. Uh, so thank you, Sarah. I wanted to, to um, ask you a, fo a follow up on that, which was, um, I mean, and you've indicated it already, which, you know, is we just need more, ben more, more straightforward and generous benefits. Um, but I mean, obviously, uh, uh, the New Economics Foundation is constantly monitoring kind of policy ideas and coming up with policy ideas and sort of very networked in that space. Um, so what do you think are the most sensible concrete interventions that could be made right now that are out there that are being um, discussed and considered and, 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 and are achievable? Well, sure. So, so one of the, I mean, I guess the cornerstones of, of policies that NEF has put forward, and I'm aware we're not the only ones, we're certainly not working in a vacuum. Open Democracy have also put forward similar proposals. Um, and also actually some of the less usual suspects, kind of some of the, the poverty charities who normally spend their time kind of advising and supporting people are recognising that this is a crisis. So um, we're also seeing similar policies from, say, the Citizens Advice Bureau, who don't normally put out these kind of policies. But one, um, one proposal we have is an income guarantee, which would essentially be providing um, an unconditional cash payment at the free at the, not free, an unconditional cash payment at the point of need, basically, for all working age adults in the UK who apply for it. And that would include those with um, currently no recourse to public funds, so it would be regardless of immigration status or, or, or anything like that. Um, so that would be those who would propose that those already on benefits would get an automatic top up to their main payment on top of additional payments for other needs. So you'd still have your kind of additional support for carers, additional support for those um, uh, with disabilities and have additional needs. For new applications, the payments would just be completely, the idea would be non-conditional and non-needs tested using the advanced payment system of universal credit, which would help bypass this kind of five week wait that the system currently has and get people cash in people's pockets a lot quicker. Um, and we're imagining this payment would be somewhere around kind of somewhere in a, a bit above 200 pounds per week. Um, so we've suggested something like 220 pounds per week, which is what based on the minimum income standard estimated by the JRF and the Center for Research on Social Policy, is the minimum need to live on that will actually not cause financial hardship. Um, and we're proposing that would be funded through government borrowing. Thank, thank, thank you. And I wanted to. So for, there's two things. First of all, you know, we brought out very similar, similar and complementary proposals. And I do want to point people to um, our petition, which calls for a very similar livable income guarantee. And Adam's going to put it in the in the chat right now. Um, if you haven't already signed it and shared um, the call, then I would I would um, strongly uh, urge you to. Um, that said, I'm going to ask a question, a contrarian question now, which is, um, you know, talk us through the rationale for this. Why should, why should this happen, regardless of, of whether people are working, not working? Um, you know, what, what, why, why the, um, what's the argument? You know, imagine this is a Today, today programme. What's the argument for this? It, it, how can it be fair that no matter how much effort people make, you know, um, they, 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 they get to earn money or, or, or regardless of whether they've, they've made any effort to get a job or, you know, how well they performed in that job. Talk us through the, the logic for this. Well, I think beyond kind of the moral case that um, people contribute to society in all sorts of ways, and that might be through kind of the more traditional work, uh, labour for kind of payment in our kind of normal work system, or it might be through caring, um, childcare, um, volunteering, all sorts of different contributions, and that we should recognise that in different ways. Um, there's also kind of, there is um, macroeconomic benefits to this, and it's kind of almost a false economy not to be doing this right now. Because we know that along with the public health crisis, this is an economic crisis here, and the econo the, our economy has been put into basic shutdown, but when it opens again, we're going to potentially, we're going to have to recover somehow. And we can either see kind of a quite a slow sluggish recovery, which is what we saw after the last financial crisis, where the economy just really can not get moving again in any kind of way. Um, or we can get the economy moving much quicker. And the way to do that is to give money to people so that they can spend it in the economy to keep the economy going and to get it recovering much quicker. Um, and right now, if people don't have any cash to do that, which if they are on our kind of our current very ungenerous universal credit system, they just won't be able to spend that money in the economy and keep it moving. So it's really, it's vital for individuals, but it's also vital for us as a society to have kind of this safe, safety net to help stabilize the economy and get it moving again. 
Thank you so much. And of course, one of the key messages mm. that we've been arguing um, is uh, the the fact that it's just grossly unjust that the most that those that were already the most vulnerable in our society are hit by the pan pandemic both both now and, and afterwards. Um, can everyone mm. read? And they're not talking because I can hear some echoes. Thank you very much. Um, uh, the other thing I would just point to, sort of looking ahead to um, what happens after lockdown, we have an excellent. Um, project on open democracy called Our Economy, um, which looks uh, not only at, at how uh, we, we, we build more just and sustainable economies for everyone now and in the future, not only in the UK, but across the world. So I would highly recommend um, people check that out and bookmark that page. Um, yeah. I wanted to come now to uh, Caroline. Um, uh, Caroline, you have, uh, you've had an interesting few weeks. You've been spending a lot of time um, speaking to at various government departments um, about um, the work, the policy around um, work and employment and business practice during lockdown. And it's been a bit of a labyrinthine journey for you. Um, so it'd be great for you to just tell us a bit. I mean, this is all related to the, the two stories you published, Don't Buy the Lockdown Lie and, and the call center story. But but um, tell us the kind of Kafka-esque experience you had and, and what, are the, what are the key things you discovered? I mean, I suppose, yes, I have had an interesting few weeks. I mean, from the start of the lockdown, I was picking up that there were two like themes that people were raising concerns about, both in my life and on social media. Um, uh, one being, you know, concerns about uh, whether they were going to have income if they weren't able to work. But the other, and often people in the same household, was people ve being very worried that they were being made to go out to work. And I was finding it like I was living in these two parallel universes where on the one hand, the media was telling me that, you know, the entire economy has been shut down and it's only this small number of critical workers who are going out to work. And I was getting loads of messages from people saying that their bosses were telling them that they had to go in to do all sorts of things which weren't critical at all, including things like chasing debts and telesales and making yacht masks and working in garden centres and all sorts of stuff. So I was phoning up uh, government and, you know, both in talking to the Department of Work and Pensions about the benefit stuff and talking to the Department of Business, it just became really clear that they were trying to cling to business as usual as much as possible. So the Department of Work and Pensions was still throughout the whole of March telling people that they had to jump through all these hoops and they had to uh, prove that they were seeking work to get these benefits, you know, being job seeking for 35 hours a week, even as the economy imploded throughout the whole of that month. They eventually lifted that sanctions regime. So, so that was kind of my first taste of slightly odd government messaging. And then I, speaking to the department of, of you know, the departments around business about what rights uh, do workers have to stay home and stay safe as they're being told to do. Uh, and basically government said to me, yeah, actually there is no law that says that essential work has to stop. There are no rules in England that um, what social distancing has to be enforced at work. There are those rules in Scotland and Wales, but there's no plans to introduce these here. And this has, been the, this has been the situation that we've been in for the last six weeks, you know. Um, there's also no, I mean, the two things really, in, you know, the welfare rights and the workers' rights really intersect because there's like, there's no rules that employers have to offer furlough, have to, even though they can do so and they can get the 80%, from, they've been able to get the 80% from government, they don't have to do that. So a lot of workers that I was hearing from were saying, you know, I e even when they themselves have got health conditions that make them vulnerable or even extremely vulnerable so that they are supposed to be shielding at home they're one of that group of people there's no right to be furloughed by their employer and and in particular a lot of people I mean some employers obviously are trying to do the right thing there you know but there's no legal compulsion on them to do that and government has not introduced any new rights and now they're talking about well now they're talking about moving on from that um, people were also really, really worried about their, their household members who were shielding and when they were being made to go to work. Thank you. Yeah, um, you, you've just indicated there that you know, when we were talking about this earlier about um, the Chancellor Rishi Sunak talking about winding down the furlough addiction as if it was something that um, uh, that we become too reliant on and would have to wean ourselves off, yeah. um, which uh, uh, is an interesting framing um, given that we have <laughs> extraordinary um infection rate and death rate uh, every day so caroline i wanted to ask you first a bit more your, your thoughts about, and then i'm going to come to you kate 
sorry about the, the the frame you're talking about the addiction framing i mean yeah. the, addiction, the addiction framing is repulsive i think and it's something that been there as i say when i was when i was sort of interrogating the department of work and pensions about what they were doing uh at the start of this crisis you know and, the, and there was sort of discussion in, in when parliament was pre-recess you know discussion there about not wanting this terror amongst government supposedly of giving people the incentive to not work you know and paying people not to work and frankly the you know the economic situation that we're in now you know if that whole narrative i personally don't really buy that that narrative around scroungers was ever valid you know as sarah says it, in my experience people aren't just sitting around watching daytime telly they're actually providing all sorts of essential roles caring for people in their community doing voluntary work looking after other family members looking after other vulnerable people that the welfare state has pulled back from during austerity and all the more so during this period of crisis where we see everyone sort of you know pulling together to try and help each other so the fact that we've still got this language of but we must incentivize people to find work when we know full well that actually jobs are going to be very difficult to come by for you know the forthcoming period it would look like um i think just shows that it's really sort of tired thinking in government and you know something that needs to be challenged uh, a lot stronger than it is being at the moment yeah yes if you look at the um uh the projections for the slowdown in, in, in economic growth this year the idea that um you know everyone should be job seeking on on a, a fraction of what some a person needs to live on um and and indeed um to, to sarah's point about and um, how do we actually get the economy going again surely it's by giving people income and um, so they can spend it on living in, in, a, in a dignified and sustainable way um Kate, um, I think we probably mm -hmm. we've sort of sat down now. Um, can you uh, hear me now? Time. We can hear you. Excellent, because I need to take that point out. That addiction thing from our Rishi did my head in because it really does draw that line between people who needed benefits and support after COVID and people who needed it before. I think the dividing line is actually on the 23rd of March. Everyone I dealt with and deal with before the 23rd of March, they weren't addicted. No one's addicted to being on universal credit. It's hell. Like it's not. A, it's not a choice to make. Everyone is either the people I deal with regularly, and um, they have learning and literacy difficulty difficulties. It's all these things that make getting to work this holy grail of getting to work difficult. And the other thing I think that's really important is heaps of people I've dealt with before COVID incidents, certainly in the 10 years before, are actually working. And I don't like to draw the distinction between working and not working and da 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 so and so forth, but one of the big groups I've dealt with and people I've seen a lot with over the years are care workers who have to be involved in the benefit system because they've always needed either working tax credits, housing benefit, latterly universal credit as those two the housing benefit and tax credits have moved to universal credit because they're paid so badly. And so it's not, people don't need this constant incentivizing, but that I think is what I was trying to say earlier when the audio died. You asked me what people, where people were at before COVID. They're in a place where they couldn't get their hands on enough money, whether, and I think, you know, Sarah's touched on that as well. People getting paid really, really low wages or really not being in a position to work anymore because they're getting older. I deal with a lot of people who have literacy and learning difficulties, and it's really unseen, but these are a lot of the people that I've accompanied to job centres over the years. And a lot of people in that category, those categories, actually had work earlier, um, often uh, manual labour, working. I did a lot of work with a guy a couple of years who was a sort of general kitchen assistant, but as he got older, he had literacy and learning difficulties, he was just limited, eliminated from contention from that sort of job because, you know, you can be replaced by someone who's 20, can lift kegs and all this other stuff. You know, he did a lot of kitchen work and bar work. Um, so I used to attend job centres with him all the time. But his big problem was LHA was never going to cover a rent. He was never going to get the kind of earnings that he had, which were never spectacular in the first place. So all of these issues sort of remain in place. And I, I feel really strongly there's a big problem with this dividing line before 23 March, after 23 March. 
everyone who was getting a benefit before 23 March was a scrounger and still needs a good slapping around. People on furlough in between months, Grace, when they were sort of like, you know, okay, we have to support these people, but now we're getting a bit worried that they're getting used to lying in the sun and listening to music and, you know, just knitting and making bread and all the rest of it. It's extraordinary to me, that dividing line. Um, would you like me to stop ranting now? <laughs> Feel free to drop in any moment. <laughs> That's, thank, thank you for that, um, for that mm. eloquent rant. Um, and please mute me when I'm not talking. <laughs> um, but we appreciate that. And, and actually, what one of um, the participants um, put in the chat, um, and this is, a, this is a very important point, another good reason to pay people an adequate income is that they need to be able to afford to stay off work if sick and to travel to get themselves tested. Mm -hmm. so this, I mean, the... If you wanted to make an only naked, nakedly self-interested, selfish argument um, at this moment, you could say, well, people who are in precarious situations will continue to go to work when sick, will continue um, to, to in, um, engage in other risky behavior, which infects other people and ends up killing and making even more of us sick. So um, it's one of those moments where that old adage about, you know, it, um, a society um, is judged by um, how they treat their most vulnerable becomes very, very, um, very real to everybody, uh, no matter um, privilege, wealth, income, uh, status, um, in a way that I think is, is, is very powerful. And, and a lot of our coverage has, has, has focused on that. Um, there have been some interesting questions as well about, um, you know, how our system um, compares uh, with other systems globally. So how are the vulnerable managing in the US with um, their very um, unequal and, and, and patchy um, system of welfare and benefits um, and, and as compared with Europe as well. So I think one of the interesting things about the US is that if you're furloughed in the States, you don't, you don't get paid, right? That, that's it. But um, unemployment benefit has been dramatically increased. Um, that, that may be a temporary measure um, but it's, that's an interesting um, policy decision and, and potentially has some interesting long-term uh, implications. Um, we just on that global perspective as well, um, I wanted to point out that a, a new project we're doing is called Humans of COVID-19, which um, just profiles voices of people who are already in vulnerable situations around the world and um, uh, invites them to tell their story in their own voice. So it's all first person testimony, audio, video, written. Um, you know, from Kenya to Armenia um, uh, to, to the US. And I would really encourage people uh, to go and, and look at um, those testimonies and listen to those uh, testimonies. Um, we, we're quite deliberately um, trying to pick out stories which um, exhibit inequality, inequality and marginalization before the crisis hit and then tell the story of how um, the pandemic is affecting and imp impacting those people. Um, and Adam Icy has put the link in, in the chat. Um, but I'd love to come back to you, Sarah, to, um, uh, to ask about um, both wisdom and um, foolishness that you see in, in other places, um, in other countries, and, and what policies we should be thinking of adopting and what policies are, are an absolutely terrible idea. Well, I think in, in other countries, I guess I, I touched on this a little bit in, in my first answer, is that in other countries, the kind of the social security system uh, that pre-existed this crisis was much stronger than, than ours is. So um, we have one of the worst, um, third lowest um, in, amongst the OECD. Um, and while the government did, as I think you touched on Mary, um, pump uh, some additional money into the welfare system, they pumped an additional seven billion pounds at the start of this crisis. Um, but that didn't go nearly far enough in reversing the 34 billion pounds that have been cut since 2010. So it's really kind of only just one step in, in that picture. Um, so I think really what needs to happen is we just need to go much further in, in strengthening this kind of social safety net. Um, and what I think other, other countries are proposing, um, I think one thing that I would not propose for the UK is what's happened in the US, which is um, sending out um, what's known as a helicopter drop of cash to people. Um, because yes, we absolutely do need to provide um, income support um, and relief to people, but giving someone, giving someone a one-off payment is not gonna particularly help with kind of the ongoing costs that many people are facing. 
and it's just kind of a one-off thing that may or may not happen again and what we really need to do is create a more strong and resilient system to give people um, the ability to meet their costs now but also meet their costs over the next um, couple of months and with some security to that as well because one of the big impacts of this crisis is causing just so much economic insecurity um, in a sense that also kind of that, that impacts people's well-being and the stress that that also creates then leads to the impacts on health as well. So we need like a much more secure system. Thank you very much. Yeah, and um, we've had a couple of interesting comments as well now. So um, Andy was picking up on a point that I think both Caroline and, and, and Kate made, um, which was um, about dividing lines. Um, and he points out, and I didn't know this, um, that uh, legacy claimants have not received the same uplift as people getting universal credit, universal credit and tax credits now, i.e. there's a scrounger narrative and framing potentially in, in government policy, even now, even during this moment, right? Not all benefit claimants are, are equal now. They're the people who were working before, you know, the, the, the pre-23rd of March, non-scroungers and the scroungers um and that's really interesting because there doesn't seem to be any other logic logical basis for that um and, and unless it's that but yeah i uh, sarah say, say more about that so therese coffee the department of work and pension secretary was asked about this specifically um and her i i'm not trying to parrot the government's thing but um the the response on that um was that it was because these so-called legacy benefits are not digital um, and so there was not this kind of um, provision to do this. Now, I don't think that's a particularly strong argument. Um, I think it might have been punitive. It might also have been the fact that the government is just scrambling to try and kind of fix these gaps in the system and just kind of trying to plug individual things. You saw it as well with the job retention system, where initially they announced it was going to cover some people. Um, then they had to extend it to the self-employment scheme and they had to extend bits and bits. So they're constantly trying to plug this gap. But really what we need and again, to come, sorry to keep banging this drum, but really what we need is a much more comprehensive system that is there to catch everyone who needs it at the point at which they need it. Yes, thank you. Um, so, someone, uh, I think Andy said uh, the wrong sort of digital system. And again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna stop flogging open democracy stuff, but um, we have a, a, a big story today about um, how some digital systems are all systems go. <laughs> um, and uh, actually we, um, we sent a pre-action legal letter to the, to the government about um, their um, massive transfer of NHS patient data to um, uh, large tech firms um, to help with the COVID response, which again is a hugely controversial area. And it does seem as though uh, in some areas, government's very keen on, um, on tech and digital and on, on ramping up um, things uh, to do with surveillance and uh, monitoring um, of people, but yet somehow they, they have a problem with the legacy benefit system. So that's that's just a, an interesting uh, contrast. Um, uh, there's another interesting uh, co contribution and question that's been made, um, and I'd love to hear from any of you on this, which is, uh, um, Adrian French says, in addition to funding individuals, what changes could be made to funding of new small community groupings that are contributing to resilience of the wider society, i.e. those beyond the third policy and third sector funding streams and this is something we've touched on as well that actually there's a lot and a number of you have said this there's a lot of work go, that goes on that's not um formal um and that's, that's not done through formal institutions um but that those people doing that work for, for their communities for their families um are reliant on the benefit system to, to support that work um so i'd be interested to hear from any of you what you think of some of the innovations um around those kind of community groups and, and, and units that, that need that, that support right now. Does anyone want to put their hand up on that one? I'll just, I'll just pick you out if, if... Thank you, Caroline, yeah. I'm, at, I'm actually gonna sort of slightly sort of push back a little bit against that and say that I think that, um, you know, like that we have this kind of choice narrative that we've had for the last 30 or 40 years, but it always seems to be that only certain people are allowed to make choices. And I think what I would like to see is a system where you know, the kind of system that Sarah and we have been talking about where actually, uh, you know, it, it, everybody has the income that means that they can make the decisions about where their skills are best used, especially in, in a global economy where, you know, that is the, the, the sands are shifting seismically about what kind of work is actually needed for the planet, for communities, you know. And I would say that actually it's not even, I mean, currently one of the really key issues 
for me, and it, it sort of touches on the point about women that was raised earlier as well, is that a lot of benefits are paid at universal credit, our, our flagship benefit and, and money as a legacy benefit are paid at household level. So one of the things that we've been putting forward is, and I know it's something that I think Ness is in accordance with, is that actually this condition that, well, if your partner's got a bit of money coming in or your partner's got some savings, you're not going to get this money. I think actually we need to get away from that and give women the economic autonomy that actually everyone's just assessed on their, you know, everyone just gets a guaranteed income that they will have enough to live on, regardless of whether they are in a in a couple or a household and then indeed if they want to be going out and and you know i mean there's a there's a lot of evidence globally i think that if you increase women's income you actually the, the, the community benefits of that in all kinds of ways tend to be quite uh manifest you know you've got all this micro credit schemes all around the world so i think improving women's income actually and taking away this kind of household conditionality and just giving everyone that livable income guarantee that would be a really good place to start thank you yeah um <laughs> There's been a lot on uh, this recent recently that you know around women's autonomy during during lockdown and um, our colleagues over on the 5050 uh, project have been doing some really um, fantastic and powerful work mapping um, the lack of um, domestic violence shelter provision and um, a range of other issues to do with women's rights and autonomy and safety um, which again uh, we can we can share in, in the chat um, but it really brings that home you know the idea of, of a household being being the unit um, the receiver you know receiver of benefits and um, you know the, the place where you shelter I think is um, is uh, very very problematic uh, at the moment. Kate did you want to comment on that question as well? Um, yeah I, I think it's an interesting point about community groups because some of the ones that I've been involved with work with, they are fantastic and really have been the buffer between, you know, people being sanctioned or not, people being housed or not. Um, and I'd be thinking things like Kilburn Unemployed Workers Group, groups like that, various housing activist groups like Focus E15 and things like that, which really do a lot of the day-to-day -day stuff. The problem I have is, and I think there is an argument to fund lots of those things because people do need funding. And, you know, if you have paid workers then that's a really good thing because otherwise people are trying to fit in around everything else full-time jobs and so on and so forth um but there's still this huge problem we have which is a complete lack of i think political support and systemic support for example i feel like the housing i attend a lot of meetings with um people have got homelessness issues or they're trying to get out of temporary accommodation into something more secure and so on and so forth and there's literally nowhere to take it anymore. There are no Labour MPs. Um, there's such conflict between Labour councils and what Labour is, and that was particularly an issue when Corbyn was leader, in as much as councils could be seen as more conservative Labour councillors. I mean, I've had more fights and more problems with Labour councils <laughs> than I have with Tory councils. But people will say to me, but that's not Labour. Labour's Germany or Labour's <laughs> whatever but the point i'm making is you actually stopped even taking cases to labor councillors or labor mps and stuff because i'd be thinking what's the goddamn point so you only incrementally sometimes you can convince a council to house someone sometimes you can't sometimes you have no idea why priority needs seems the same for this person and that person so it's all very random and that sort of takes away i think the community group thing is great and i actually think that's probably where change will come and they're certainly much more positive than the establishment outlets, say councils and so on and so forth. But the bigger picture is so problematic because you can only fix one thing at a time. And it's really hard having no political party to go to, if you see what I mean, to, to lean on things, to make those changes because you just hit this natural ceiling, you know, where you're no longer, the people you're dealing with, you, you're no longer involved in, in anything that can actually change things okay. it's the story. yeah Thank you so much I'm, I'm really glad that you you brought that point and I, I would like to talk about Caroline actually on this about, you know, what are the opportunities for an opposition that actually wants to hold the government to account and and wants to do that powerfully and I would really encourage everyone to to chip in here in the in in the comments and stuff and I, I will read them out um you know what should an opposition that takes itself seriously as as uh, in this moment as holding the government to account and i don't just mean labor i mean all opposition 
um, what, what should they be doing? Um, Caroline, come to you and I'd love to hear from everyone in the comments too and then Sarah to you. I think for me, and I was making this point quite forcefully on May Day actually, uh, is that you know you need to see, I, I would like to see Labour and all the opposition parties really being much more kind of conscious and explicit and articulating the link between workers' rights and welfare rights. You know, because I think we've kind of lost sight a little bit of the fact that as the welfare state has been shredded, that undermines workers' rights so much. And we see that so live right now. You know, there's all these concerns that workers are going to be made, you know, the unions and labour, to be fair, are currently expressing concerns now that workers are going to be made to go to work uh, when it's not safe to do so, when there isn't social distancing and when there isn't PPE and when the work isn't essential. So they're expressing concerns about that. And of, and of course, absolutely one of the solutions to that is for people to join unions and organise in the workplace and demand that their employers do more than just the bare legal minimum, even as our government probably intends to cut that legal minimum even further. But I think, you know, the, 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 the link to the benefit system is that, you know, everybody who's just an ordinary person with a job knows, you know, I know, that if I annoy my boss too much, I might get sacked and I'm going to be on the benefit system and that's going to be a miserable place to be. Fortunately, my boss is on this call, my boss is quite nice, but I'm not, you know, it's like that fear of being on the benefit system, which has got so much worse as the level of benefits, as Sarah says, has declined. You know, it's not an accident. I mean, they've used that scrounger narrative and Labour, unfortunately, has sometimes joined in with that scrounger narrative. Uh, but I don't think that's the real reason. I don't think they are really scared that we're all just sitting there watching daytime TV. It's that they want a pool of people who know that being in, on benefits is so miserable that any job, however underpaid, however dangerous, is, you know, you, you kind of have to do it because you have no choice. So to be able to give low paid workers, you know, meaningful choices of actually, I don't have to jeopardize my health. I don't have to go to this workplace where the, work, where the boss hasn't protected me from catching COVID because, you know, I'll organize and I'll try and stand up for my rights. And if the worst comes to the worst, I'm gonna be having, you know, I'll be able to live. I'm not gonna have economic catastrophe because the benefit system, the safety net will be there to catch me if it really, comes down to that you know we've got we've got what we've had one in three people going to work during this crisis going out to work you know even two weeks ago and that is a very high figure and a lot of those people are very unhappy about it and thinking that they don't have any choice in the matter at the moment so i would like to see labor speaking to both of those the workers rights and the welfare rights agenda much more uh you know they've got an opportunity there's political space now that there wasn't before i think Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and, and we've had some contributions come in. So um, uh, someone said opposition should be increasing funding for social care, creating higher minimum wage for social work care workers, maybe 15 quid an hour, paying for that higher wage to attract and retain staff, ensure there are enough staff, reduce numbers of staff working in more than one care home. That's been a very live issue. Um, and then actually, Sarah, I wanted to, to, to bring this to you as well. Um, uh, but uh, Ryan has pointed out that the government shelved an immigration bill a few weeks ago that would make it harder for doctors and nurses to come into the NHS. Um, this bill would have made it virtually impossible to recruit social care workers from overseas. He says, tragic, it took a deadly virus to prove the point, but how does Brexit potentially cause issues for choices going forward? Um, so, i.e. Uh, Brexit's not so much in the, in the news agenda anymore, but um, you're talking about uh, the long, the medium and long term economic outlook and making the argument that um, putting more money into, a, into, our, into the pockets of, of people who, who will spend it is both morally the right thing to do and a good economic policy. Um, uh, we've seen a, the crisis create some good outcomes in terms of immigration policy, but um, many more um, uh, economic impacts because of Brexit coming further down the line. So I wonder if you could sort of respond to that, that point um, as, as well as, as, as what we've just been talking about with effective opposition. Um, okay, so first, first on, on the Brexit point, I mean, I think it's clear that Brexit, or it's not necessarily clear, but certainly a no-deal Brexit will exacerbate many of the issues that we're already seeing um, in terms of um, cost of living. So we're seeing food prices, food prices skyrocket, skyrocket already. Um, a no-deal Brexit will absolutely compound that and make that significantly worse. Um, but also, yeah, like 
Brexit will um, impact immigration, um, it will impact um, people taking on, I guess, the key jobs, the key worker jobs that we're realising, or not really realising, but the government is acknowledging now that are the kind of the key things that make our society run. These are jobs that are often done by, by migrants, less likely to be done by um, UK nationals. And so Brexit will make that, that worse. And so we, one of the things we definitely need to do is to make sure that key workers are paid significantly more. They're paid um, proper living wages, as, and particularly social care is a, a clear example of that. Um, but in terms of kind of what, what an effective opposition should be doing, um, look, the, the government, um, this obviously caught everyone completely unawares. I mean, we should have been, we should have had a, pro a much stronger kind of set of economic policies in, in place that would have protected us in the first place, but we are where we are. Um, and how we act now is a choice that's really going to shape the kind of recovery that we get. So we really need to kind of make much more bigger, bold economic policy over the next couple of months that will help shape how, how we kind of recover. And I think some of the things that um, are absolutely necessary um, is an investment led recovery. So we absolutely cannot see any kind of austerity or any kind of cuts going forward. In fact, we need the opposite. We need the government to step in and invest in the things that we need to, um, to build the kind of um, society that we want going forward. So we need um, massive investment in green infrastructure that will help, um, help deal with the sustainable create kind of a green recovery. Um, we need massive infrastructure in our investment in our health system, in our social care system. Um, and we need, um, we need something that looks like an income guarantee going forward in a more long term, funded by complete reform to our tax system um, that will enable um, in the long term to have kind of an income floor for people while still strengthening the generosity of mean tested benefits on top of that. Thank you, Sarah. And um, Car I, I've got to quote something that Carly Jeffrey said, which is, don't give up on all Labour councillors. So some of them are the real deal and, and will step up. <laughs> so we'll take that. We'll certainly take that feedback. And then Ryan also said, maybe an unpopular opinion, but cross party consensus needs to be reached and call the leadership to account over migrant rights, low paid, unsafe work and benefit cuts. I think there's a, a reality here, which we have to acknowledge, um, which is that the Prime Minister's um, job approval ratings are still very good, um, uh, that um, there is um, striking levels of support um, for a lot of what, of what this, this government is doing. And um, I think to, to ignore that or to, to pretend that that's not the case is, is, um, uh, uh, is a problem. Um, and I do also uh, agree, and, and I, I would like to um, uh, encourage others to comment on uh, Ryan's point about about cross-party consensus in a moment. Um, I, there's one fun thing I'd like to do first, though, which is point out that um, and for those of you who've been listening to to the discussion and indeed have read um, Ca um, Caroline's excellent pieces, you're going to get 12 out of 12 on this. But um, we've got this fun quiz, which is how well do you know the current UK lockdown rules? Um, if you've listened to this entire webinar and um, and read uh, all these excellent pieces, then um, you might get 12 out of 12. I got 11 out of 12, um, but it's worth, um, worth doing because it's, it's really informative as well. So um, we, we shared um, the, the quiz uh, in, uh, in, in the chat there. And um, I think it's a great way of actually um, opening up a conversation with uh, others who aren't so engaged on this issue um, because everyone thinks that you know if they've been listening to the news or reading the media they are, they understand um, what, what the rules are around around lockdown uh, and actually um, very often there are some big uh, misconceptions um, I saw Nigel Farage tweeting about how um, the scientific advisor who had to resign the other day because he he met his his lover you know should have um, had a visit from the police but actually there's he was breaking absolutely no laws. He may have done something silly. He may have um, gone against his own guidelines, but he wasn't breaking any laws. There we go. I've, I've, I think I've, I've ruined, uh, the, spoiled the answer to one of the questions actually. So um, uh, it's it, anyway, it's fun and, and it's worth checking out. Um, someone, uh, Andrew says that the narrative appears to be so ingrained after years of media support that every time a party challenges the scroungers narrative, um, they're called, um, 
they're ridiculed and called unrealistic or naive. How do we change that? And obviously, apart from supporting independent media, which thank you very much, Andrew, for pointing that out, you can support open democracy. Um, and if you want to make a contribution, having thought that this is a good um, panel, do go to supportopendemocracy.net and um, we can put the link in there. But but beyond that, yeah, how do we change that, that narrative? And I think that's probably where we, we will finish is just um, uh, calling on each of the panelists uh, to think about the ways in which we reframe this conversation away uh, away from the frame of of you know the the pre March twenty third the benefits uh, the, the, the scroungers versus the strivers, um, what are the sort of most uh, challenging and inspiring um, ways in which we can reframe this narrative? Um, Carol, I'll come to you first simply because you're off mute and because you work in media. Um. Well, I saw someone say, how can we change the narrative apart from funding independent media, which absolutely I would encourage people to do. Um, I think we, we need to be braver, really, you know, like there is a real opportunity here. I think the, the debate on, on migrants in particular, you know, like that's where the scapegoating always starts, right? And so actually, you know, if you look now, the fact that we're only as strong as their weakest link, that the hostile environment to migrants is still scaring people off from accessing healthcare. And we see the consequences in terms of the, the, the spread of this disease in areas which have a high black and ethnic minority population, you know, and this is not in anyone's interest. I think the fact that we can actually, um, you know, turn around and say that, you know, I mean, there was, there was a huge public outcry uh, early on in the crisis when there was a, uh, some Spanish workers who were sacked from their hotel where they worked in Aviemore and then they were ending up sleeping in tents. And it was one of those stories that kind of, you know, went viral and then sort of died out the next day. But it's like there was, you know, these are the migrant workers that, that the Brexit media has taught us to hate. And actually, you know, there was this moment, you know, even Johnson himself said, you know, that, that we're all human and we're all fighting this virus. Well, let's, let's, take that to its logical conclusion and I, and I think actually let's not be cowardly and triangulate in the way that Labour has sometimes tended to do and other opposition parties have sometimes tended to do and try and fight the Tories on their own turf by being tough on benefits and tough on migration they'll never win that argument you know let's actually go to the heart of this the virus has showed us we have this common humanity where we need to look after everybody the NHS, we're all clapping and celebrating because that's really the only example that we have in this country left, which does look after more or less everybody. Um, it's, there's still problems in accessing it for migrants. Let's tackle that. You know, there are MPs getting behind the campaign to end the hostile environment for migrants in the NHS. And let's broaden out from there the principle that everybody needs supporting. Thank you so much, Carol. And, and just um, riffing on that, um, Eric points out that, you know, this can be done. The Finnish government is allowing migrants to take up temporary work, even if their migration status hasn't been settled. You know, this, this, is, this is a thing that people are doing. <laughs> um, Kate, um, just thought, your final thoughts on reframing the narrative. What, what are the key things we need to do? Um, I always thought, and it was one of the things that, not confused me, I noted during the Corbyn years, you do things, you talk to people from the ground up, which is an incredibly patronizing thing to say. But one thing I notice, and this is a sweeping generalization, is actually very unfair, but I'll go away anyway, which is some of the things I attended, like I go to, um, there's a bunch of us leaflet outside Stockport Job Centre once a week and so on and so forth. Over the whole the last three or four years or what have you, those numbers really haven't swelled at all, you know, like, people who are activists on, on that kind of front line doing the sort of weekly um, welfare advice session, that sort of thing. The numbers just didn't grow. And I was hoping with the coming of momentum and stuff, I'm not a Labour Party member and not hugely sympathetic, but I, would, I was hoping that that sort of face-to-face -face on the ground stuff would improve. And, you know, I know that in some places, some things they did, you know, Momentum, Corbyn, there wasn't just one kind of person, heaps of activists. I know heaps of people who were like union members and really active on the ground. So, you know, it's, it's an unfair thing to say that the numbers didn't grow, but I feel like that face to face thing where you can have a chat with people, and I'm not, as I say, I'm not a member of a political party, and, you know, the honest truth is I pretty much hate them all, but it's, it's that sort of like interaction. One thing that comes up a lot, for example, is people would be talking about migrants and immigration. And that comes up a bit outside job centres or various interviews and stuff. And I'll say to people, well, I'm a migrant, I'm an immigrant. 
And people probably don't mean you. <laughs> or I've had people say things like, but you're the kind of people we want, which is actually a quote from my book from someone. Okay. And I just think, yeah. Because we have to we have to wrap up, but I think... Yeah, sorry, yeah. I just think face-to-face -face is what I'm saying. Yeah. 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 Human yeah. contact and, and interpersonal relationships. Yeah. Um, Sarah, best thoughts on reframing the narrative um, around these issues? Well, without trying to be blind, blindly um, optimistic and naive, I think there is um, a real opportunity here because I think what this crisis has demonstrated is that a lot of the things that we thought or a lot of the things that the narrative said were completely impossible or just outside of what we could possibly yeah. do have happened um, over the last couple of months. Um, the, the government basically managed, told local authorities they had to end homelessness and kind of get everyone off the streets. Now, of that did not, not, not all homeless people wanted to um, stay off the street. So it's, it's, not as, it's not as easy as that exactly sounds, but um, local government did mobilize to make that happen. As, as um, and I think another kind of area of opportunity or where, that, where the narrative can start to change, I think someone, I saw someone mentioned this in the chat somewhere, I think it was someone called Julie, um, basically that with so many more people, particularly on social security, with many more people entering the system who had never experienced it before, they're starting to experience the kind of outrageous unfairness of the system that, that those on the system have realised for years. And, and it's often maybe not so much the usual suspects. This, this crisis has made a lot of people realise that, or really expose the fact that many people really are living paycheck to paycheck. Um, and we need to do things a little bit differently. So I think, I guess my, uh, my note of optimism is that we can change things if we want to, and we need to just continue to actually start talking about that uh, with our friends, um, with, with everybody through, through our work, and try and um, try and change that as much as possible and hold on to that hope. Thank you so much, Sarah. That's that's a great way to end it. Um, and, and indeed, that talking about longer term change, um, next week's webinar is going to be after lockdown. How do we fix Britain's dirty money industry? Uh, uh, Britain is still one of the world's largest laundromats um, uh, for corruption and all, all kinds of uh, dodgy financial practices. Um, so we have an excellent panel. We've got um, Peter Gagan, who's our investigations editor. We've got Oliver Bullo, who's a journalist and author of Moneyland, Why Thieves and Crooks Now Rule the World and How to Take It Back. And we've got Susan Hawley, who's a director of Spotlight on, Corrup uh, on Corruption. So we're just going to tackle that um, we'll, we'll sort that one out next week. <laughs> so please do join us again. Um, again, if you if you think this is uh, this has been a valuable and worthwhile um, discussion, please consider um, supporting our work if you can. It's support open democracy. Um, uh, dot net i believe but uh, we'll, we'll put the uh, actual correct link in in the in the chat support open democracy dot net forward slash donate thank you um thank you so much to all the fabulous panelists it's been a really great discussion today um and thank you to everyone um, who took part and sent in uh, your thoughts and questions um thank you all and i hope you have a very pleasant evening <laughs>